So it's a terrific pleasure to introduce you. Uh, we're looking forward very much to your talk. Uh, and I think over to you. Thank you so much, um, David. Um, I am equally delighted to be here with you. Uh, I must say, I consider you very much um, my friends. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So, um, David, you gave me the title, The Future of Pediatric Neurology. That was your title. And, and I must say, um, I didn't quite know what to do with it for the simple reason that this is a cover normal conference. However, um, I think your professorial hat was well on it um, because it really intrigued me and made me think a lot. Um, when I shared uh, the title with my colleagues yesterday, one of my excellent registrars and a dear friend of mine told me, but what are you going to say, Grace, that relates to cover normal? And I said, well, we shall see. And, and I, hope, I hope that I'll do you justice. Okay, so your title was the future of pediatric neurology, but this is um, a cover normal conference. And my thoughts were, should I be talking about pediatric neurology in general? But that wouldn't really be very interesting to you, would it? It may have some points of interest, but not really very interesting. Or should I just be talking about pediatric neurology as far um, as it is relevant for covering normal families? And like everything in life, I suppose, there is an overlap, isn't there? And I think I will be concentrating mostly on that overlap and hope, hopefully achieving that aim. Okay. Now, you must understand, all of you, that there is a personal slant in everything in life, okay? No matter how professional you are and what role you have, you will always carry your personality with it. And this is my personality um, to the lecture, I suppose. It will come with it. And if I had to be organizing a dinner party, then you are most likely to have pasta there and pizzas and fish. And uh, Deepak dug out this garden party I had with the rest of the team, and uh, we were all enjoying that very much. However, if you had to ask Deepak to organize a garden party, then the food in front of you would be clearly very different, but equally enjoyable and equally networking in, in nature. So that is his garden party at his house and uh, me and my family and all our colleagues there. And so I suppose what I'm trying to say is that being your bringing your personality to to something is is always very important and diversity is enriching and I think the more we learn about things we always learn that working together uh, brings brings achievement. Okay, so I'm just trying to think of the case. Um, so the format of the talk um, is going to be as follows. I can, I firmly think, because when I think, for example, of um, where would my children be going, then I always have to think about, well, I can only look at the past and the present to see how I can formulate that answer. And I suppose for this talk, this is going to be exactly the same. I think the future can only be based on an understanding of the past and how things have evolved and the present where we are now. And I will be talking about the future of pediatric neurology, focusing mainly on the Earl of Overlap, as I explained in the Venn, Dam the Venn diagram. And I will be, uh, and I apologize for that, putting my personal slant to it. <clears throat> okay, so many of you will not know this, but um, Deepak has just organized a massive international neurovascular meeting. And we, you know, one of the big topics was cavernomas. And the title for that talk was Cover Normal Small Formation, More Than Just Raspberries. And uh, it, it was a joint presentation, so I presented a lot of what I'm going to be presenting today. But then Professor Ian Kumar presented the surgical aspect of it and um, some of his operations, which you have seen in previous annual general meetings. But then we also presented transition. And Daniel Horsgrove, who is our adult um, new neurosurgeon, uh, presented his slant on the adult cover normas involvement. So that was an excellent lecture. And I, I suppose what I'm trying to do here is to show you that uh, we are taking cover normas, cover norma and, and the issues around it um, to our international and national meetings to increase awareness. Um, my my story as a pediatric neurologist that is always that always starts with a patient. 
So how it all started was just after 2010, and it was uh, soon after that I got this letter from your charity, and I got a referral uh, from one of the pediatricians that asked me to organize an MR scan for a child that had undergone some regression with some neurofocal uh, neurological deficit. And I couldn't understand what was going on from the letter. I couldn't, you know, very often when you are a professional neurologist for a long time, from the letter, you can understand what's going on with a patient. Um, but with this patient, I couldn't really quite understand what was going on. And the other thing is that for children, very often when they need a mask, you have to sedate them. And I'm always very keen, as are all my colleagues, that if there are any other additional investigations that we should do, then we should do them when the child is sedated to minimize suffering and uh, hospital stays and inconvenience and risk for families. So we always really try to do that. So I said, mm, I better see him first, just in case this is a white matter disorder, which is a completely different thing. And in case I need to do other tests like lumbar punctures and blood tests. And I was very glad I did so actually, um, because the history was suggestive of a child with some developmental problems, nothing major. But then he had a history of developing a neurological deficit, a clear neurological deficit in terms of his motor function that improved with time. Almost suggestive of a stroke, to tell you the truth. And I remember distinctly, I was agonizing whilst I was speaking to the family, should I start him on aspirin? Should I start him on aspirin? And then I said, well, I, you know, I don't quite know what's going on. Let me do the scan first. Um, and, and in fact, um, when the child went to have his scan, I got a call from a MR scan. Now, you, you don't know this, obviously, but when we get a call from a MR scan um, in pediatric neurology, it's always something, you know, dramatic and serious. And, and I remember um, our superintendent of the MR scan department phoning me, telling me, Grace, come down. You need to come and see this scan. It's very abnormal. And indeed, it was very abnormal. It was a child who had multiple cover normas, and indeed one had bled um, in the past, which had explained his history totally. Now, um, this was Friday, as usual, um, and I asked my PA to book uh, the family um, uh, the next available day in my clinic, which I think was the Monday, and uh, started reading um, because, you know, I wanted to be well informed before I met the family. And I just typed in cover normas and your uh, website came up. And I still remember it was a very beautiful day, actually. Um, and, and I was just in the garden. And I sent an email. And immediately, I think I got a response from Ian and yourself, Dave. And, uh, and that was very helpful because you guided me through some of your resources, etc. cetera. Um, I was struck by your availability, your professional behavior and your willingness to have an interested clinician. And these are very important points because, you know, we have all sorts of charities out there and some are helpful, but some are really not helpful to professionals. And what I'm trying to say is here that I really admire the way that you handle the Cover Noma charity because it is truly a professional charity that helps patients and professionals. And I would like you to uphold those values because they are very, very important. Okay, so um, the journey started and there are lots of photographs here um, of some of that journey. I don't know if you can see your mouse, but um, obviously before I met the family, I downloaded your, your, um, your leaflet. I had information to give them. I had venues for them to explore. And of course, it was shocking for them, but at least they could understand that there are things out there and that people were making an effort to help them on their journey. Um, this, I think, was Ian Komali's lecture a couple of years ago. And that was fantastic, as we all know. This is Ian Komali fundraising at our hospital. This was uh, the James Lind Day that we had in London. Um, and that was an enormous learning experience for me. These are some of the cover Norma days that we held in Manchester when Ed Smith as well came to speak to us. Okay, so that is sort of the story of how I started to became, become interested in cover Normas. But actually, you know, you cannot kindle interest in a, in a person unless there is a bit of an interest already there. 
And so, for example, if someone tried to get me interested in politics, then, you know, they could throw anything they wanted at me because I would never engage because I really do not like politics at all. So what I'm trying to say here is that I personally have had a very long standing interest in stroke and Moya Moya. And over the years, I had an increasing interaction between Professor Kumali in some clinically very complex neurovascular cases. And I don't know how he managed to tell you the truth, but because it, it was probably one of the busiest times of my life, he managed to talk me into setting up a neurovascular clinic um, uh, that we started with four times a year in 2016. And it was absolutely fantastic. And it's grown so much from there. It's becoming um, slightly too big, actually. And Deepak and I um, are really uh, trying to, to think on how we can get more resources and more help uh, because it, 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 it has exploded. So in 2022, which is where we are now, we have uh, Deepak Ram, who is clinical lead. And I must say Deepak has been I mean, he has exploded really and is a, a well recognized uh, figure internationally on pediatric neurovascular disease. Okay, so he'll be a fantastic lead and will take these to new heights. Um, two pediatric neurologists, me and uh, Deepak, two pediatric neurosurgeons, Professor Ian Kamali and Mr. Demetrius uh, Bartolites, two adult neurovascular neurosurgeons. Um, and they are present in our transition clinics, um, and they also join us for our pediatric clinics, and actually we find their input very valuable, and the families find their in input valuable because they hear what they are likely to expect as their children become adults, and I think that has been very valued by all of us. We have a specialist nurse. And we also have two interventional neuroradiologists now who, again, have brought much richness to the neurovascular service. And for cover nomas only, because that is all she's interested in, in terms of neurovascular disease, because again, she is extremely busy, we have Dr. Liz Jones, who has also spoken to us on some of our cover noma days. Okay, so in 2018, uh, and I, I, I will illustrate this growth to you in terms of numbers. 2018, we had five Cavernoma families, and in 2022, we have 27. So you can see how much um, that has grown. And we have presented these posters on, on the flux of change and development at the BPNA and various international conferences. So um, clearly, the service has grown, and I have illustrated on that. Um, and what I have said that I am going to do is that I am going to base where I think the future is going on an understanding of the past and the present. And one of the things that I'm going to share with you now is that in my entire training as a pediatric registrar, I had never ever seen or managed help manage a child with cover nomas. And you might say, well, what's the reason for that? Was that because Grace was lazy and tried to shirk work? And then not at all, okay, the reason for that is multifactorial, but I think mostly it's because historically cover nomas have been managed by the neurosurgeons, and they would only call us if they ran into problems with seizures, for example, or something like that. And that has changed dramatically now, but I just put it there because that is very important. With growth, so as a service grows, then the, the, this generates experience, opportunities for training and development and research with better outcomes for all. And I will take you through this. Okay, so growth generates experience, opportunities for training and development and research with better outcomes for all. And that growth has really been sustained with very close interaction with Cover, Cover Noma Alliance over the years. And in 2019, David and the rest of Cover Noma Alliance helped us set up an online survey with all the families. So these are not children that came to Manchester. This is the whole uh, Cover Noma Alliance. And I think at the time you had 80 Cover families and 31 of you responded. So it's about 39%. And this is some of the feedback we got. And again, we presented this poster at the BPNA. It will come as no surprise to you that the greater majority were due to CTM1 and the greater majority of the cover nomas were supratentorial, but there were a few in the brainstem and I was delighted to see that you have a talk later on about brainstem cover nomas. 
because they are, uh, I think, you know, some of the very important ones. And as Professor Incomali always tells our patients, and as is well documented in the literature, um, in, in more than 75% of cases, there are absolutely no triggers for bleed. Uh, and most were discovered really after a bleed causing either a phys physical deficit or a seizure, very much like the, the first patient that I came across. And in most people, the most common physical deficit was a hemochromesis. And there were 13% of children who had epilepsy on treatment. What really surprised me at the time, but what I see with my own eyes every day, is that there was a lot of mental health and education issues, far more than I expected, than uh, could be accounted for by the small areas of acquired brain injury. And this is something I will come back to you later on, because I, I was struck by that at the time, and I think it is something that we need to raise uh, awareness around. I was also very struck by the fact that you had the first talk around anxiety, because I think that's important. Okay, so we have at the moment, um, after six years of service, 27 children with cover nomas, 10 male, 10 females and 17 males. And the average range is four to 24 years, median is 12.75 years. And the most common mutation, as we've already discussed, is script one. Um, and uh, many children have a single co I'm sorry, there are children with single cover nomas or else children in which no mutation was accepted, and that's 26 percent. And then we have several, very few numbers for CCM2 and CCM3. And the complications, again, very reflective of, of the survey that we had done. Um, epilepsy on treatment, 15%. Hemiparesis, 3 uh, I have one with an online neuropathy, and I put that, really, um, just to sell a story, because I think stories are important. They teach us what happens to patients. This was a boy who has uh, multiple cavernous, uh, cavernomas. He's got CCN3 and, um, and he's not that badly affected, but he developed an, over, uh, an ulnar neuropathy after a fracture of his arm. And everyone assumed that it was the cavernomas that caused this, uh, and no, not much attention was paid to it. However, when we saw him many years later, we explored this fully, and the cover nomas has a, had absolutely nothing to do with this. And, and the ulnar neuropathy actually caused quite a significant deficit for him in, in terms of the function of the hand. And what has happened is that he had developed a neuropathy secondary to the fracture. And my message here is that it is sometimes common for everyone to blame everything that happens to a child or an adult to the known underlying disease to the detriment of exploring and managing the actual problem more thoroughly. So I think that is a message. We have um, a couple of patient palsies. And uh, again, um, so surgically removed six, and this was either in the acute phase because of significant bleeding or on re-bleeding. Um, but again, quite a significant um, percentage that come to us with a lot of emotional, mental health and problems around the education setting. Okay, so um, growth generates experience. So if we just move into that a bit. And as I said, I was quite, quite pleased to see that your first talk was around anxiety because my experience, um, and I, I think David will comment afterwards as well, my experience is that we really have to pay attention about the mental health implications of having cover illness. A lot of families are anxious. A lot of families' well-being and quality of life is affected more by the mental health issues than the actual cover normals themselves. And I think this is a real shame, actually, and I see it, you know, you put in the in the leaflet, David, it was very kind of you to explain what my role within the NF service is. I have a lot of families in which the fear of the condition impacts their quality of life more than the actual complications of the disease themselves. And so I think this really needs to be addressed because, you know, if your quality of life is affected because you have a hemiparesis and epilepsy, 
to a certain extent. Of course, you manage them, but there's not much you can do about it. It's part of the disease. But if you have nothing at all, i.e. you're absolutely normal otherwise, and you have a poor quality of life because of all the mental health issues, because you have this genetic diagnosis or else you have findings on your scan, then that perhaps we can do a bit more about. It. So that is my message to you. And I suppose I can also talk to you about my experience from acquired brain injury. I spent 10 years of my career looking after children with enormously severe traffic accidents, okay, having spent 10, 20, 30 days on intensive care. And, and, and the, of course, they are, are burdened with anxiety and mental health issues. But, but what I see is that this cover norma burden is almost on par with that when actually the areas of the brain affected are much smaller. So this is just a, a bit of a, a message that I would like to portray from my experience. Okay, the second thing that I'm starting to see in clinic and not in just the cover noma clinic, in the cover noma patients, this is generic, okay, everywhere. It's the expectations around support for mental health. And the reality of what we can offer within the NHS and the expectations is enormously um, different, okay? The waiting lists are enormous. Um, so for example, I can refer someone for clinical psychology or to a psychiatrist and the waiting time is a year or a year and a half or two years. I mean, what's, it's too long for anyone to wait. But the problem is that is the situation. And, and if that is the situation, what can we do to improve that? And there are two aspects, I suppose. We can continue to fight as clinicians, and we do that constantly. Please never doubt us for a moment. We never stop fighting for our patients. But I suppose as a charity, what I'm trying to say is, can you as a charity explore ways in which you can support your members' mental health whilst they are waiting for, um, for these appointments and, and perhaps increasing families' resilience? And this is just a suggestion, uh, but they are generic. Um, so we've just come from a conference in America for NF1, and the same the same teams run through, okay, improving resilience in families. And a lot of the families there stated that what they find more helpful is, is other families rather than attending a lot of appointments. So these are just thoughts I'm putting there too. Okay. So I'm coming more into the sphere of the role of the pediatric neurologist now. And I tell you that what I think the one of the most important parts of my role is navigating the maze of the NHS. And people are always talking about how difficult it is for families to navigate the, the, the maze. And I tell you, of course, it is because we find it difficult. And the maze is there because there are so many professionals that are needed. And believe me, every single one of those professionals, and there's a massive list there, is important. One of the so I got COVID straight away at the minute of, and in the beginning of the outbreak because my husband kindly gave it to me because he's an acute physician and he came from uh, his ward ground very ill and gave it to the whole family straight away. And this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think uh, we were, Joe was very poorly, but I was maybe away for a couple of weeks. And one of the things that struck me when I came in, um, right at the very beginning and height of the pandemic was the bins. You know, there, were, there was poor emptying of the bins because everyone was in the state of the height of the pandemic. And it was horrible. You know, I mean, we quickly settled down, but the point is every single member of the team is very important, okay? The cleaners, the bin collectors, the bed coordinators, the therapists, the nurses, everyone, everyone. So being able to navigate the maze is extremely important, but it's not only important to navigate the maze, it is also important to be able to be the captain of the ship. Now, um, David, you said that we've known each other for many years, and Ian, um, but I bet you never knew because I am a proper film geek, okay? So one of my weaknesses in life is, and I really enjoy watching films. 
and and it's great because Deepak enjoys watching films too. <laughs> so um, you know that's one of my weaknesses, and I love this film, The Master and the Commander. I think it's just an amazing film. And I got the shot um, yesterday when I was looking through the internet um, because you do have to be the captain of a ship as a pediatric neurologist. But also, if you look at um, uh, Russell Crowe's facial expression, he's not exactly ecstatic about it, is it? It's not an easy job to have, okay? He's not smiling and skipping and dancing for joy. He is somewhat burdened there. Navigating the ship is never easy, but it is a very important role and one that can generate a lot of respect. So Russell Crowe um, generated a lot of respect um, in, in his role there, and it's a great film, if anyone wants to watch it. Okay, so one of the things that um, I mentioned was the opportunities for training. So I had said that when I was a trainee, I had never once had to manage a patient with cover enormous. And actually, I helped manage, to patient, manage patients with much rarer conditions that cover normal. So I think the fact that the pediatric neurologist was not very involved in the past with the management of cover normas and has done house change now is very important. So all the pediatric trainees in, in Manchester now have have lots of, 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 of experience with managing children with cover normas. All of them have contributed to posters over the years, BPMAs. All of them have attended study days, some national, some national and international. All of them have regular involvement with our regular neurovascular MDTs, where up to three to five families with cover normas are presented. And all of them have had involvement in the complex inpatient pathway of care, including neurohabilitation. And so what I'm demonstrating there is that through this growth and experience, um, we, we are training now our trainees to become consultants who have experience as being captains of the ship. Um, so the second thing that the pandemic has taught me, besides uh, the importance of everyone, is that human resources are our most precious resource. Forget about money, forget about anything, forget about buildings. The most important things that we need are humans. Because without them, you could have all the money in the world, all the fantastic buildings in the world, but there's nobody to do anything for the patients, okay? Really, really important. Without ourselves, nothing will succeed. And the services that we set up have to have the right skill mix. Again, every single member is important. It has to have the opportunity to provide training, inspiration, research and development, and it has to have strong leadership. And we all know that when you have a house, the most important thing is location, location, location. And I tell you, for pediatric neurology and I think for everything else, it is training, training and training and and that is the key for future pediatric neurology it's our trainees and one of the things that i think um i learned most through cover Norma is the process of how you have researched your important research questions and i am indebted to cover Norma and my interaction with them on, on inviting me to be part of that process because it taught me so much. Um, and, and I put this slide here and that is me there um, and Ian and David. And then um, there's Conor Malucci there. I don't know where Kamali is, but he's there, there he is. Okay, and such an experience actually to see how well you've done it and, and I know it was a long process and it was agonizing for all of you because I'm sure, you know, the effort you put into it has taken years. But I am delighted that I've been part of that learning process because it has enriched me a lot and that you are now on the cracks of providing, you know, the care trial of which Manchester in the center. And, and I think that is incredibly important. So well done you. David asked me to to be thinking about the future of pediatric neurology. And I've explained the journey of how questions are being raised for the treatment of cover nomas. 
and uh, we we talked a bit about the care time. However, as a pediatric neurologist, we have experience of other diseases and where they are up to in terms of research. And what I did yesterday is look at clinicaltrials.gov, which were the international studies that are occurring on any disease are occurring. It's a very useful resource because sometimes we get weird questions like, is there treatment for such and such extremely rare disorder? And, and if you type into the search button there, then all the trials that are ongoing of, of value and repute who are properly resourced and properly researched come up there. And there are about 14 trials going on, and most of them are about the natural history of what happens to cover nomas. There are trials going on into understanding biomarkers of severity of the cover nomas. Um, particularly trying to identify which ones are the more severe ones that are going to develop and that may indicate um, uh, uh, indicators for more aggressive intervention. And there are studies about statins and propranolol. But what I haven't seen anything about is, is targeted treatment. And I guess, it's I guess this is because we are still far away from there. But I think as an organization, you have to be very mindful that if you are thinking about pediatric neurology, and if you are thinking about how pediatric neurologists think at this point in time, and are increasingly thinking about care in the future, this is where the future is going. Okay, this, it's, this is all where it's going. It's about targeted therapy. Uh, targeted interventions, either in the genes themselves or else in the downward pathway of the gene productions. And I will, I put up three, three posters there about actually about three, three diseases where such targeted therapy is now available, all of which Manchester is heavily involved with, all of which the processes has cost thousands and millions and billions of, of, of pounds of research, but has actually now provided complete life-changing treatment for what was otherwise consistent to consider to be a terminal neurodegenerative disease or else a disease with significant impairment, morbidity and mortality. So, for example, I don't know if any one of you have heard about Batten's disease. This is one of the most awful neurodegenerative diseases of childhood. I mean, only a neurologist or a family who has been affected by Batten's disease will know how terrible this is. And Deepak is one of the principal um, uh, principal neuro oh, sorry about that principal neurologists involved with this therapeutic intervention is no longer a trial, you know, it, it's an intervention. And then our neuromuscular service is now offering uh, regular treatment for people with um, SMA. And this was something that was lethal in, in infancy. Okay, it's so absolutely awful, completely normal brains, but, you know, neurodegenerative disease in which the children couldn't breathe any, anymore. And for NF and the plexiforms, finally, we have something that can help for neck inhibitors. And this has just improved, uh, been approved by NICE in May 2010-22. So what I'm trying to say is that I think the key in the future, of course, all the other trials have to keep on ongoing, but it's just to give you a vision because that vision is important. It's a bit like the captain of the ship, okay? What would the captain of the ship be there for? unless to take the ship from one country to another you know otherwise there's no point that you have to have a vision um and and uh i think that would be the vision and the way forward now i've put up a slide there for um that that Liz jones who i told you was our clinical who is our clinical geneticist who's very interested in cover aroma and she gave me uh, this slide to explain you know, very, very nicely, I think, the concept of a double hit mechanism. So when someone has the mutation for one of the cover normas, um, half of their chromosomes and half of the genes involved are affected by the mutation. But then across as they, you know, as life proceeds, they get a double hit. So the other chromosome becomes affected. And what happens then is that the cells that have the double hit 
will develop this cover noma. And um, the cover noma genes, there are three of them, lead to overstimulation of this pathway, and that leads to more proliferation of abnormal um, vessels. And I suppose the future one day will target one of these pathways, um, and, and that will be the vision for the future. Okay, so um, in summary, um, I think that as in everything, the future of pediatric neurology has to have his foundation, um, the building blocks on past experience. I think the trainees need to learn how to have strong teamwork principles because otherwise it will never work. So I'm, I'm sure you can hear me being snuffly and poorly and uh, be back with my clinic on Thursday. You know, it's as simple as that. Uh, it was either cancelled the clinic or someone else did it and Deepak just stepped in and did it. So this, the, this strong teamwork is essential. Without it, it, it doesn't work. Nothing works. Leadership is important, okay? And I'm delighted that uh, Deepak is going to leave for the service because I can be lead of two services and I'm getting old now and I need to be thinking of succession planning and, and Deepak is a million times better for, than me. And, and that is what is important, you know, this 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 handing on to someone who is strong and better and younger and will keep on taking the ship forward. Um, trainees and succession planning is incredibly important, okay? So um, I have just been awarded National Training Supervisor, or not National, sorry, Regional tra Training Supervisor of the Northwest, and I'm delighted to have that because I am passionate about my trainees. Um, because I think they are the key to our future. Mental health, please, um, if, if you take nothing from my talk today, please let us think about how we can improve the mental health for those who are actually quite well, but whose quality of life is imp impaired by the anxiety around the condition more than the condition itself. And plus continue to support the mental health of those who are very affected, obviously, but both are important, both. That is my message. And um, please continue to push for research and development. That is your key. I tell you, I've just come back from, from the CTF conference in America and the CTF, you know, just look at their website. The amount of research they do is just unbelievable. Of course, they are very resourced because um, they, they are Americans, but there is a CTF of Europe um, uh, and this linkage is extremely important. That is the future. And I think targeted treatment. So I hope that... Um, the ship will continue to be led um, and reach its destination and grow. Thank you very much. Well, Grace, that was a totally amazing talk you've given to us. It was beautifully presented and really thought provoking. And it covered a range of ground that I never anticipated when I invited you to talk. Um, Grace, I don't think we, we've not had the pleasure of meeting, um, but you're very much a legend um, amongst the Cava families. I've had several messages this morning, them all shedding disappointment because they've got various football and dance classes to take the children to. Oh, they were very sad to miss it, but they've in, we've ensured them it's recorded. So, yeah, I mean, it was just to bring up the point you said about sort of mental health and the importance of recognising that and supporting that. And just so really that you know for your patients, one of the things we've done over the last four years is developed a really good um, therapy program. Mm -hmm. So we offer a really unique service to children. And, you know, we've got some children who had brain surgery two years ago. You know, they had that therapy then. But then when things trigger or things get hard, they can step right back in because we've got the continuity of the therapist who worked with them for the last four years. And we offer that to children, to young adults, to families. We do family therapy groups, adults. Um, so we've recognised quite early on from a support perspective that mental health is one of the main triggers for living with a rare condition. So we are developing that and that's something that we offer. So just so you know, when you have your patients come through, that that is something we can offer as a charity and something we're quite proud of. I think you should be to tell the truth because, because it, it's a problem. Mm. You know what I mean? Not just for covering families, for everyone, for everyone. And the resources are so, so limited. 
No, it was um, it was interesting what you said as well about sometimes the anxiety and the depression and things can be a bigger trigger than actually the condition itself. Because I know, I think the team, some of them are all nodding at me, but we find that particularly with families um, that it's more mm. the parents that are caught, you know, not offensively mm. or anything. It's their worry that is causing more problems than the actual treatment the child's receiving. So. I think we all look as a team and as an organization to look at different ways to support those different needs, but with the carers as well, because by supporting them, you're also supporting that person who's living with the condition, but there's lots of complexities to it and there's still lots of work to do. Um, there are lots but, yeah. of complexities, but I think that is why I put the word experience there because we see it mm. and our, our viewpoint and, and Deepak, Deepak, please join in. You don't need to put on your hand, you know, you can, we are, you know for me you can just talk with me um, but we see it you see we see it the fear of the condition impacts the health of the whole family and impacts negatively so the more support you can get for your families for that it, the better it is the better it is that was i suppose what i was trying to say Deepak, please pitch in. yeah no definitely i was just going to echo that i mean thanks chris for such an excellent talk and i'm glad david at the end picked out your strengths because at some point i felt you were underselling yourself with your humility and just saying how you managed to get everyone in who's leading the service but actually everyone knows in kevinoma alliance that grace is our go to person when you need networking because she as david said responds to everyone very quickly builds relationships so well so we are in this position now only because of grace so thank you in terms of the mental health i think you know it is still a big issue and i think you know we direct a lot of families to kevin Omar alliance and like both of you rightly pointed out it is uh, mostly the parents and you can understand that how difficult it is um mm -hmm. in fact the most challenging families i have are the ones where families are asymptomatic the parents are asymptomatic mm -hmm. and the, they have two mm -hmm. children with cavernomas who've bled or had epilepsy and they were then screened and found that either the mom or dad had it and they are actually asymptomatic and they are you know in their 40s um, and been fine and their two children struggling in school and having all these issues um, and one family even told me that you know it's like a cycle of mental health uh, issues for the parent um, that uh, they had to go through that whole cycle with the first child and just felt that they were getting therapy coming out of it, just managing to stabilize their own guilt, although they shouldn't be guilty, uh, and then have the next child present and then have to go through all that. And they said the mm -hmm. trauma therapy they go through is more than what the child is affected by uh, and the acquired brain injury. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's really a lot of work we need to still put in. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deepak. Um, so, so I suppose, Deepak, thank you very much. Very sweet, actually, as always. But I'm not underselling myself. What I'm saying is that, you know, I'm clinically lead of a complex service now. And, and, and you've taken over the leadership of, of the neurovascular service and you have taken it to new heights. And, you know, I would welcome all the participants in this chat, in this, in this AGM, um, you know, to welcome Deepak because he's done an outstanding job. Uh, and and uh, personally, I'm extremely grateful um, to to work with him. He's Thank been you. amazing. Um, Deepak, uh, the other, so I, so Deepak is right. Actually, this is what I've been trying to put across. And and I will I will give another example. Um, and I will try and do my wording very carefully because obviously we are talking about families here. So. It, it, I've had a recent experience that has taught me a lot, actually. I've had a child with a complex disorder who was absolutely fine, but had a genetic diagnosis. And for, for four years, um, I have worked with this family to try and come to terms with, with the genetic diagnosis and to, to, to trust us. Okay, now this concept of professional trust is, is very difficult, okay? And I think it takes one thing sometimes and you completely lose trust in your profession and, and it's horrible when that happens. But this concept of professional trust in your team is really important. If you trust your team, then I suppose your team is there to share the responsibility of looking after you. 
And I think this, this is particularly for parents. What we have these days, and this is why I really like our normal lives, what we have these days is, is hundreds of patients who, who look up Google and, and tell us what to do. And of course, you, can all, you should always listen to families. Of course you do. And I am the first one that listens to them because sometimes they tell me, oh my God, could it be this? And I say, oh my God, oh my God, yes, 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 of course. And I go and look for it. But the point is that this is really important. It's important for families not to think that Google um, supersedes actually the advice of the MDT. Because sometimes that can be counterproductive. If your MDT, if your group of professionals, and you've seen that list of people there, I mean, if Grace has a bad morning, Deepak isn't going to have the bad morning on the same day, is he? You know, so, and Ian is not going to have a bad morning on the same day. So the MDT actually protects patients. A good team protects patients that it is not just an isolated doctor making a mistake, for example, or an isolated nurse. There are others. It's the MDT that is speaking. And what I'm trying to say is that if the MDT tells you everything is okay, go and enjoy yourself, it is okay. Yeah? The team will tell you when things are not okay. Don't fret and worry before that. You know, this family, four years of agony they went through when their child was absolutely fine. And then I get an email from the nurse saying, Mom said everything is absolutely fine, but she noticed such and such. And I went, hmm, I've never seen such and such whenever I've seen this patient. And what I did was actually, I swapped a, a scan under a GA. Now, for those of you who don't know how long the waiting time for a GA scan is, it's in the order of a year, a year and a half at the moment. So what I did is I swapped one of my GA scans about another patient who was not um, in any danger of waiting and had a chat with them, of course, and they were absolutely willing. And I put this one in because I did not like that comment in that email. Um, and I asked for the video and the video reassured, not reassured, reinforced my concern. And actually, immediately, there was a real concern, and we picked it up straight away. So what I'm trying to say is here, do not invent problems. If your MDT is saying everything is fine, it's fine. Yeah, obviously, do trust your instinct, because sometimes doctors do make mistakes. But doctors also in an MDT will pick up things. Um, I'm just trying to convey that concept to you, that when the MDT is clear that there's nothing to worry about, enjoy yourselves. Go and have hot chocolates and ice creams and barbecues. Thank you.